Want to uh, sit on the make a clanking noise, the mug. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Trey. Hi there, Jeff. How are you? All right. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I we're we're not uh, broadcasting yet. We will in just a moment. Nice bug. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, I think we've got a good uh, group now. That, that uh, yeah. so, uh, uh, what I'm go ahead. Uh, should I uh, now uh, tweet uh, the link? Uh, nope. That, that if you tweet that link, you'll tweet people to actually join the. No, I'm at, uh, I, do I tweet one to the T3W or? Uh, no, I'll give you the link in just a second. Okay. okay. Um, I'm setting that up right now. So, okay, I'm going to hit uh, post uh, broadcast video. At that point, we're going to be uh, broadcasting. And then I will uh, get the link at that point. Okay, it's live. So if I go to my stream... Okay, I'm just putting it on the T3W page at this point. Okay. And Still not there. Uh, reload. That's what I'm doing. Problem with like Google Plus. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so just link to that post. Yep. Just reshare that. And for those of you who have joined us live, uh, don't worry. Uh, we'll be actually doing something interesting in a minute. We're just getting set up. Come here, Watson. I need you. I can't hear you, Craig. I was talking to my dedicated staff. Uh, <laughs> um, so we're five minutes in, so uh, why don't we get this uh, show on the road, huh? Beautiful. Great. So. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Trey Harris. I'm here with uh, Jeff Jarvis, and uh, I just wanted to welcome you to a uh, the first of what I hope will be uh, many conversations online uh, brought to you through this new format that that I'm calling an experiment in conversations. It's uh, T3W, which stands for something. I might let you in on later, um, and. 
what we've done is uh, a few days ago, Jeff uh, and I posted an announcement, and we invited people to uh, join us in a conversation about uh, Jeff's new Kindle single, uh, Gutenberg the Geek. And uh, yesterday, I l went through some of the people who have gotten involved on the conversation on Google+, and uh, invited them into this conversation. And so the, uh, they'll be joining us in just a few minutes. But uh, first, I wanted to say uh, hello to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Trey, and thank you for having me in this. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, you know, as Trey pointed out, I find that the conversations on Google Plus tend to be good. On, on Hangout, which is a great tool, they tend to involve, just as you saw a few minutes ago, hemming and hawing while we figure out what to do. So Trey's experiment is trying to add content and conversation into Hangout, and I'm really honored that he uh, is uh, launching this with my Kindle single called Gutenberg the Geek. Yes, and uh, I'm, I, I hope that uh, many of you had a chance to uh, take a look at Gutenberg the Geek. Uh, it's a, a great and short read. It's, uh, what is it, uh, 99 cents, Jeff? Something 99 like cents. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm not used to using this uh, iPad app, but uh, here we go. Uh, you can see that there's the title, Gutenberg the Geek. And uh, I, uh, I think the first thing that I'd like to ask you, you know, we had a lot of people on the conversation who wanted to discuss specifically uh, the Kindle single question about mm -hmm. Uh, what is a Kindle single? We talked about that in the announcement a little bit, so we don't need to go through that again. But, but more of the question: Why? Why did you do Kindle single? Aren't you aware that it's locked up with awful DRM? You know, what were you thinking? Um, well, I, I first off should say I intended no irony in doing a Kindle single about Gutenberg, uh, but uh, I, I I got rather obsessed with Gutenberg when I when I uh, researched my my last book. I'll plug it right here, called Public Parts. And um, so I wanted to come back and write something more from a different perspective about Gutenberg as the proto-entrepreneur. And I wrote a piece uh, that was translated for Wired Germany and then uh, tried to pitch it here to a magazine. The magazine said, nah, we want to cut it down, we'll do this and that. I thought, all right, this is the time when I want to learn about the Kindle single. So yes, I did accede to their... Um, uh, rules, which is it's a six-month lockup, and they'll promote it and so on. But I figured if I was going to be in for a dime, in for a dollar, I wanted to learn how the Kindle signals work, so I did it. So far, it's sold uh, about, <clears throat> last I checked uh, two days ago, about 7,200, 7,300 copies, which means I shouldn't quit my day job at getting 70% of 99 cents. Um, they promoted it some. Uh, it was an easy process. They did the copy editing, and they created that cover you saw. And so I'll try it. After six months, I can then just put it up for everyone to read, which is what I'll do. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, uh, you got the idea starting with... Uh, Thanks for the plugs. Yeah. Um, this is my first time doing a Hangout on Air. I, I, I noticed that for me, this is mirror. This is mirror. Is it mirrored for you, or is it no. on the right? Okay, good. I'm going to be learning this, this time around. Um, so... Uh, you talk about Gutenberg here and there in uh, public parts, but uh, tell me a little bit about how uh, you said you got so obsessed with him. What, what I mean, maybe give us a one sentence uh, a summary of, of uh, public parts and then say how that led you to look at Gutenberg. So in public parts, I, I wanted to talk about publicness, about the, the Internet as a tool of publicness and why it's so important to protect. And to get there, I had to get through a few other things. I had to discuss privacy, which is it's not binary. It's not at war with each other, but it's, it's an important choice that we have. And mm -hmm. just to say this, I believe in privacy. I have a private life. Privacy needs protection. I'm all for privacy. But I'm also all for publicness, for this ability we now have, thanks to the Internet, to share. And I did some historical research, you know, not a lot, frankly, going back to uh, Gutenberg in the early modern period and the notions uh, out of a project out of Canada about the press as one of many tools of publicness, the stage, uh, printed sermons, art, markets, uh, and so on, also were tools of publicness. And as I read through about Gutenberg, I, I really became obsessed, in part because of a wonderful book, an 800-page poem by Elizabeth Eisenstein, 
uh, which is called uh, The Printing Press as an Agent of, of Change. And she is the key scholar of Gutenberg. And one thing that really struck me was how she says that the book did not take on its own form for 50 years after the, the printing press was invented. It started with scribal fonts. It was, it was called automated writing. Now, I'm not suggesting that the parallels are by any means exact or that we can always you know, take history and put it to today. But I think that there is an analysis that says that, that we have to look at the internet and, and understand the, the stage we're in. I think in Gutenberg years, we're about the year 1472. So that's part of Gutenberg as publicness. But while I was also researching Gutenberg, I became absolutely fascinated with the idea that he was perhaps the first technology entrepreneur and that he faced all the same entrepreneurial challenges, business and technology challenges, organizational challenges that a startup faces today. And I teach entrepreneurial journalism at the City University of New York. So in fact, I use this in my classes to try to show how some of the challenges of entrepreneurs are universal and almost eternal. So I, I guess I didn't give you the proper uh, introduction to, to start. You're a CUNY journalism professor. You're the uh, uh, director of the... I'll always get a uh, plug-in. Don't worry. <laughs> You're the director of the, the Town Knight Center for uh, Entrepreneurial uh, Journalism. Can, can you... What, what is entrepreneurial journalism? Is that people who let themselves, uh, you know, they take a little money under the table for uh, a good quote? <laughs> over the table. Over the table. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's trying to teach journalists how to start their own businesses. I really started the, the class at CUNY uh, when, when the school started six years ago because I think the journalists have to learn the business of journalism. When I came up through the business and through school, we were told to stay away from business, that it was corrupting. And that, I believe, made us as journalists poor stewards of journalism. And I think that's part of the reason, not by any means all the reason, but part of the reason we're in the mess we're in today because we didn't think about the business reality we're in. And so when I find these kinds of, of opportunities like Gutenberg to show that even he had to deal with technology issues, raising capital, cash flow, um, uh, deal structure, all of these things that a, that a startup deals with today, it really does kind of bring it home and say that this is not some newfangled thing. This is straightforward business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's uh, one of the, the more interesting things in, in uh, the, the single. Um, I think several people uh, referred to this fascinating uh, balance sheet that you, that you uh, reproduced. Uh, can, can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, let me take, it, take you through it. I, I want to say right off the bat that I um, depended very heavily on two authors, uh, and I'll plug their books as well. Uh, there's a very nicely written uh, book called uh, The Gutenberg Revolution by John Mann. It's, it's, it's a fun, easy, light read. And then the definitive Gutenberg biography in English, it's out of print, is Johann Gutenberg, The Man and His Invention by Albert Kapper, who happens to be a uh, type designer. And they're both wonderful books, and so it's, I, I rely on them entirely uh, to, um, to, to give me the basis of this, and I just try to look at what they wrote then from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, the p l is at location 198, so let me get there. Um, so they, they did the good work of putting together a p l for his business. Mm -hmm. And uh, to run through it real quickly, they, this is all in Goulden's, uh, but they said the production of six presses uh, was probably uh, about uh, 240 Goulden, 40 each. Uh, I think it's uh, Capra talks about the, the press's mighty screw, which is a great, a great phrase, a big iron screw. Type cases and frames and desks, 60 goldens. Rent for the facility that uh, they use, the Humbrecht off, uh, 30 goldens. Heating for stoves and uh, melting metal uh, was another uh, mm -hmm. 20. Production of the hand molds. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the key invention that Gutenberg came up with was a mold that enabled the swift uh, production of type fonts at scale. So that's 60 goldens. The metal was 100. The ink, 30. Paper, which was imported from Italy, 400. Vellum or hides for 30 of the copies, 300. Wages, bed, and board for up to 20 staff, 800. Interestingly, they believed that he had to buy one handwritten Bible for reverse engineering. So it came to a total of 2,120 Gulden. Now, he had to borrow the cash, and he had to go through cash flow to, to exercises to get there. But he borrowed um, 1,600 Gulden from Johann Fust. And uh, as it came around at the end of the process, just before he was ready to put the, the Bibles out, 
uh, he would have been in a for-profit business, in a profitable business. The 30 vellum copies at 50 golden each would have sold for 1,500 golden. 150 paper copies at 20 each would have sold for 3,000. So his total take would have been $4,500. And mind you, he borrowed 1,600. But Johann Fust came in just before the Bibles were uh, made public, and he was a partner in the business. He and his son-in-law were involved in the business, and Fust called the loan. And there was a court case about this in the refectory of the Barefoot Friars, and that's how we know all this detail. And uh, Fust in, contended that Gutenberg had, um, had used the, the capital for other means, for example, printing um, indulgences, which Gutenberg needed to do to raise cash flow. So at the end of the day, he didn't have the cash to pay back a Fust. He lost his main printing business at the Humbrechthof to Fust and uh, then had to go off on his own. Now, he did not, uh, according to legend, die penniless. He, he uh, ended up being honored for his invention and got a pension and other things, and he kind of opened up. But a friend of mine uh, named John Callan uh, said after reading the thing that he wondered that the rule for entrepreneurs now is whether you want to be first or foost. <laughs> So uh, as you see, uh, we've begun to bring in our panel, um, and uh, I uh, want to I want to introduce some folks as as they come in. I, I've uh, had a chance to talk to some of you uh, yesterday and before. Uh, uh, first, uh, Shava. Uh, hi, Shava. Uh, hey. Uh, just tell us real quick where you're from, what you do. Uh, my name is Shava Nirad, and this marks my. 30th year working on the internet and I've done a variety of things um, probably most notably I think Jeff might actually know me as the original executive director of the Tor project working on internet uh, anonymity software so uh, privacy and security and bravo for that uh, but I actually started 30 years ago working on the first commercial multimedia software on uh, Vax VMS on the IVIS project, uh, which wow. was educational software in 1982. That, um, humbled to be in your virtual presence, Shana. Uh, that's, that's well, very... you know, it, it was entirely accidental. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it means that I've been working in public interest internet in, for 30 years, more or less, on and off, but mostly on when I could afford it. Well, let's get through a couple more hellos and uh, get back to the conversation. So, uh, uh, Radoslav, you're from uh, Croatia, right? Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm from Croatia. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur small scale and I'm also a journalist. I used to write for computer magazines and now I almost exclusively write for online uh, magazines. So I'm pretty much uh, on the internet. No, well, thanks for joining the conversation. And uh, finally, uh, uh, for now, we're going to have a few more people join, I'm sure. Uh, George, uh, you're from uh, New Jersey and you're retired? Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a former uh, lighting designer uh, involved in the entertainment industry for a good uh, 30 or 40 years and uh, retired about uh, five years ago now and uh, I had a bit of a technology background from the entertainment industry involved in some software development and things like that. So uh, still very much involved uh, in uh, technology type things which is why ebooks have excited me so much and uh, particularly Adding ebooks into a Google Hangout seems like a wonderful thing for me to get involved in now too. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rich. So, um, so Jeff, uh, one of the themes that came up in the the uh, conversation that got started in the the Google Plus post before we brought it here into video uh, was the question of um, is this really new or not? You know, we're do, do, some some people said, you know, you could just pick any entrepreneur at any point at any time and say, hey, look, they were a tech entrepreneur. Um, and some other people said, well, no, no, Gutenberg was special and, you know, such and so ways. And some other people said, no, Gutenberg has nothing to do with tech entrepreneurs and you're just, you know, kind of spinning us a yarn, Jeff. So uh, 
what, what, what do you say to that? Well, perhaps so, but I think that, and, and, and one never claims provenance for anything online, so I'm sure someone will come along uh, out of the grave and, and, and beat Gutenberg, but, but I think that there's an identifiable person who started a new technology, uh, who perfected that technology and led it to, to uh, use at scale, and created not only a business but an industry around it. Uh, I think there's a decent case for, for making at least one of the grandfathers of technology entrepreneurship. Now, some could say the person who invented the wheel uh, did it, but I don't think that person uh, had uh, a copyright uh, patent on it and uh, an industry behind it. If you think well, about that, it, that's what I found so so um, interesting is that you know there there was there were lawsuits, there were patents, there was the 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 partner who you know ends up betraying you, all of these tropes that are just kind of built into the thread of Silicon Valley entrepreneurism were there in the story of Gutenberg. And at the end, that he was done in by his cap table and his cash flow. And how many entrepreneurs have faced that? So you could, you could accuse me of stretching the parallels, and I'm sure I'm guilty of them in some ways. But as a, as a, as a tool of my students, it's really valuable, because it really does, again, show the eternal nature of those challenges. And if you go through what he did with technology, uh, how he had to get just the right kind of metal uh, so that it would uh, uh, melt but then cool quickly to allow the making of fonts at scale. The hand mold that he created was the, was the key invention. But the press wasn't so much. Presses were already used for olives and, and, and wine and so on. But the hand mold is an ingenious thing that, that creates the, with, with the font uh, etched into uh, or pounded into copper at the bottom, the lead and antimony and such is poured in. It has to have a ridge on it so it will exactly fit in a line of type, it's really quite brilliant, I think. And, yeah. and so he did create all this technology. He did it at first very, very secretively. He almost got screwed by one of his founders. Um, and, and in fact, like, like Coke or Colonel Sanders, kept things in different places so no one would know all the secrets going on. I just find those parallels too juicy to um, pass on. Shava, it sounded like you were trying to get in. Um, well, one of the things that I find really wonderful about Gutenberg is that the, the visionary aspects of it is that it was a world-changing thing. I think that the inventor had a clue about, even if he didn't have the idea of how much it would change. One of the things that Jeff points out is that he actually did understand some much some amount of how much it was going to flip things on its end as he was in his process. Um, and like the web, or like some of Apple's stuff, or like some of Google's stuff, perhaps, he threw this into the mix, perhaps with some self-protection and some trepidation and some couching and some idea that there was going to be mimetic change and societal change around his invention. And those things um, really, you know, are part of the story around Gutenberg stuff. I used to, uh, back in the time uh, when I was at UNC Chapel Hill and the web was coming in, I used to throw a book that you that Jeff uses in his bibliography, uh, Marshall McLuhan's Gutenberg Galaxy, uh, when we were bringing up uh, Sunsite, sunsite.unc.edu, Launchpad, uh, now iBiblio. Uh, I used to throw uh, Gutenberg Galaxy, which is from Marshall McLuhan, around and sit there and say, look, this is a book from the 1950s, which is in the spirit of hypertext, which is bridging oral tradition to written tradition to hypertext in a book that was written in the 50s. Yeah. And if you are thinking about how we need to think that the web is going to move things into the future, you should read this book. And I like to think that there are phase changes in communication 
that are inflected across people that Gutenberg was one of those inflection points that he was sort of sitting there at a crux where, where we were when the web came online where he was thinking about things like that himself too. I, I highly recommend, I, I mentioned this very briefly in the Gutenberg piece, but I mentioned it in more detail in, in public parts, but I recommend that you Google uh, the Gutenberg parenthesis. It's from a bunch yes. of uh, scientists at the University of Southern Denmark, and it's a wonderful concept, just, just to mention it for, for the rest, that they argue that before Gutenberg, um, knowledge was passed around mouth to mouth, scribe to scribe, it was changed along the way, very little sense of ownership and authorship, and Books done by scribes were there to preserve the knowledge of the ancients. Along comes Gutenberg, and as McLuhan says, then uh, our, our model of knowledge became linear. Things had a beginning and an end. Says, Gutenberg, says uh, McLuhan, uh, the line, and this very sentence is an example, becomes our organizing principle. Knowledge becomes owned and authored, and uh, it doesn't change. It's, it's set in, in, in a book, and it's about trying to honor the knowledge of current scholars. Then they argue that on the other end of the Gutenberg parenthesis, where, where they say we are now, knowledge again is passed around link to link, click to click. It is remixed along the way. There is less of a sense of ownership and authorship. Um, and, and David Weinberger, in his new book, I'll hold the ball up here, Too Big to Know, which is a wonderful book, um, <laughs> says that uh, the wisest person in the room isn't the ancient or isn't the somewhere in the room now, but it's the network. It's the room itself. Now, what these scientists argue in the end was that what this did was change our cognition of the world, not our brains, but our, our basis of comparison for how we understood the world. And, he, and they say that the, to go into the Gutenberg parenthesis was very confusing for people, very unsettling. I would argue that we're somewhat at a similar place now in, in our cognition of the world and how we interpret things. And we still obviously interpret them on legacy views. And so, yes, I think at, at McLuhan and Gutenberg becomes really meaty today and even meatier given McLuhan's pressures. Yeah. And I would actually uh, like to insert that remix culture is a return to pre-Gutenberg yes. oral tradition of a plastic culture that is taking all forms of culture and merging them into a uh, common tradition rather than the linear tradition and if you go back into the Gutenberg galaxy you can by McLuhan you can exactly see that prediction from the 1950s in McLuhan uh, written right out in 19 I believe 57 um, and completely unprepared in uh, copyright law yeah. Uh, let, let me interrupt just to uh, introduce a, a newcomer, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, not Jeff Jarvis, but uh, Jeff Orduno uh, is, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a lawyer from, uh, uh, Il from Illinois, is that right? That's right. I'm from near Chicago. I'm from Rockford, right? Thank you. Welcome. Um, so George, uh, you, had a, uh, you had a question that, that if you'll forgive me, I want to, I want to, uh, piggyback on and just say that, you know, when we, when we look at a lot of these parallels between Gutenberg and Tenka Hatrimeters today, um, there are similarities and there are differences. And, and one that I found interesting was uh, you said that uh, the, the uh, period that it took from, uh, uh, to go from conception to product was 1437 to 1455. And, you know, I think 18 years would be a long time for a tech startup today, right? I mean, and even the, the Wright brothers, if we go back 100 years, they went from conception to product in 15 years, right? So uh, are, are, things, are, are things speeding up and speeding up, as somebody said in the, the comments? Uh, or, or do you think that it's just... George, what do you think? Well, what I was uh, relating it to is the fact that of the speed up is exactly what's happening today. Like even a book, we know about it before it even comes out, whether it's coming out digitally or whether it's coming out on paper. Uh, you know, was Gutenberg in his, in his own time with his contemporaries, how was he being looked at? Was he the entrepreneur that, 
standing out among, among all of them, or was he uh, totally hidden and no one discovered who he even was till 50 years down the road, especially in, like you said, it took 18 years for the first project to develop. Well, that, then that was fine and it was out in Germany and there it was, but when did it get to Italy? When did it get to France? When did it get somewhere else where people started saying, hey, this is really uh, something brand new and this guy is uh, the entrepreneur? Yeah, I, I think that, that there's a bit of a mixing going on here in the sense that the, the, the time frame given by that one author includes Gutenberg's schooling, I think, in other uh, uh, technologies that, you know, as I mentioned in, in, in the piece, uh, that he made these uh, mirrors, tin embedded mirrors for pilgrims, and that taught him some things. And obviously he was working on stuff in Strasbourg before he came to Mainz. So there's some debate as to whether or not the first printing was done in Strasbourg or Mainz. And then he put out a beta. He didn't put out the Bible first. He put out the Donatas grammar uh, and had to learn how to do it. In a way, it's not nearly as pretty, but it, but it taught him. And then you're right that, that he, was, he knew he was on to something, Shama said too. He, he had to know because he kept it such a secret. And when one of the brothers of one of his dead partners tried to come into the business and he tried to keep him out, people were lusting to get into this business. And they knew there was something here. We don't have record of what they thought it was, but we have record of their passion to get in. Um, and then after Foust took the business, or most of it, uh, Gutenberg, uh, this is where I admit I stretched quite a bit trying to argue that he's going from Apple to, to Android, but what the heck. Um, but he then opens up, and he trains a lot of people, starting with Nicholas Jensen, who did one of the most beautiful fonts to this day, Jensen. And uh, uh, Jensen went on to Italy, and, and, and printing then spread around because it was opened up, because he trained people. So I think that he knew he was on to something. I think it took a long time for him to develop this. The final point about speed, I, I, I think it's a seduction to believing that we are operating under this lightning speed these days. And I mentioned the idea, this, was, this actually came out of a piece I did for Google's Think Quarterly, the idea that perhaps we're not really going through this change at a fast rate. Uh, perhaps we're going through it at a very slow rate, which was to say that it's barely begun and that we don't know what the internet is yet. That's why it's wrong to regulate. That's why it's wrong to limit it, uh, because we've got to let it grow and figure out what it is. And I think we're actually very, very early uh, in this development. Uh, the argument I make is that we're at the year 1472. Yeah, and uh, actually, when you said uh, uh, 1472, when I read that, the very first thought I had was, when was Martin Luther born? And it turns out he was born in 1483. So uh, the question is, in what 2023, who is going to be uh, what, what baby is going to be born that's going to change the course of, of human history? Well, right? that's right. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's not. We always say we wonder if it's some kid in the garage who's inventing the future. We don't know yet. The kid is not even in vitro yet. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to quickly uh, uh, introduce. Uh, uh, Alex, who, uh, Alex, you're uh, originally from Germany, so you have a, a connection to Gutenberg in that uh, that way, I suppose. Um, and you're a, you're a psychology consultant in Texas, is that right? However, ten years, yes. Welcome. Yeah, that's correct. I, I live in Austin, Texas, most of the year, and I'm originally from Munich. So, sure to stop. So certainly the the. Um, the Gutenberg thing is a big deal in Germany still to this day, and actually, you could almost argue that you know that's been more discussed, uh, uh, you know, in sort of German journalistic and intellectual circles and so forth, than actual even you know everyday uses of the internet, you know, for social media and whatnot. Uh, you know, as you as you probably know, the Ger we Germans like to overthink stuff. So, <laughs> uh, off. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. So yes, uh, what I wanted is to relate uh, with Luther, because at that time uh, a scribe, uh, it will take two years for a scribe to make a copy of Bible. It's a pretty long time. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, Gutenberg is that uh, one of uh, more lucrative businesses of his uh, was actually printing indulgences. 
So they will just print out indulgences. It's the paper that uh, the, the church says, whatever you sinned, you paid money for it. And that's wh wh one of the theses of Luther uh, was against these indulgences, which happened to be printed by Gutenberg. But what is important is that, in fact, uh, his thesis uh, got 300,000 copies in two years. So that means, uh, OK, th th it's just uh, one piece of paper. Uh, what uh, takes scribe two years to get just one copy of Holy Bible for Luther's thesis by the printing press, by this Gutenberg invention, it's 300,000 copies. It's a pretty big amount. It's, it's, it's a big number even today. Imagine how it happened some hundred years ago. Yeah, and isn't that one of the important technology concepts that we always deal with today, which is scale? and that Luther brought scale to both the printing of indulgences for the church as a business and then to the printing of Martin Luther's fight against it. And a few concepts come out of that. Uh, I, I get in trouble for not saying this the right way, but, but we can say that technology itself is somewhat agnostic, not to make a pun, uh, in that it can be used for one side or another. And after Gutenberg lost his presses to the Fuss, uh, there was a fight over the control of minds among two bishops and they printed tracts for both sides. Uh, and, and I think that's very important that, that, that technology can be used both ways, but the scale really matters. When I went to the Gutenberg Museum in Mainz, uh, it was an awe-inspiring moment to stand before his Bibles, but it was also awe-inspiring to stand before the case that had indulgences printed by Johann Fust and his son-in-law in the same case with Martin Luther's tracts. And Martin Luther was the first best-selling author in the world. And the change that he could bring because of that scale, you're absolutely right, uh, was sped up in a way that couldn't happen otherwise. Do we have this argument today? Uh, some put up the, the, the straw man saying that, uh, well, the Arab Spring is not a Twitter revolution. I know no one who says it was a Twitter revolution. It was a revolution of brave revolutionaries. But the impact of the tools in helping them organize, to find each other, to know they existed, to be able to, to do what they do, matter. And the same, I think, is true uh, in the Reformation, that Martin Luther was Martin Luther, and he was going to do what he was going to do, but the printing press obviously enabled him to get to more scale and speed. Right. Yeah. I think that uh, the, the, the velocity question is... I mean, it's it's interesting, but but I, I think that a lot of folks in the the uh, online thread uh, got into some nitty gritty details about the actual technologies and you know what happened first and second and third, and uh, the point that I made to somebody was that so you whether or not you know when it was and in exactly what the theses were, you certainly have a vague idea that Martin Luther nailed up these theses to a door, right? But uh, uh, was were the theses handwritten or were they printed? That that nail was it machined or was it hand? Uh, uh, what was it? Was it made it a, a on an anvil? Right. I, I mean, the, these details are kind of aside from the point, right? Because it's just when the human structures change, that's what we remember in history, right? The the the, the specifics about you know exactly what moving parts took place to have the thing happen are not as important in my opinion. I just read a fascinating book, and I don't have to hold up like the others right now, called The Institutional Revolution. And it argues that, uh, it tries to understand the, some of the crazy institutions, the things that look crazy to us, like the aristocracy or buying commissions in the army, and why they operated the way they did. And an economist who wrote it argues that, that it was changes in technology that allowed the measurement of performance, that allowed ships to know the latitude they were at, that allowed clocks to operate, that allowed measurement, that those things then obviated the need for these institutions that came before that were all about trust and being able to trust someone in the aristocracy. I think today we're going through a similar thing where we're trying to figure out what our institutions are, and the institutions themselves are trying to hold dearly onto the past, while the internet is highly disruptive, just as the press was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that, that uh, we should probably, for folks who may not uh, uh, be up on their their uh, pre-reformation history. What what was an indulgence exactly? It was it was it it was a thing that you paid for to get into heaven, right? Well, get get your relatives out of purgatory uh, sooner, right. 
and they were used uh, for specific campaigns. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, at the time, it was, it was against the Turks. And not only did Gutenberg print indulgences to be sold by the church at scale, but he also printed uh, calendars that had daily exhortations against invading Turks. And so these were, were, were political and military campaigns of the church at the time. Right. And so, you know, was this, uh, uh, was this him selling out, doing the indulgences? I mean, he wasn't a revolutionary, was he? No, I mean, it was what was happening at the time. Uh, I, I think it's a good question, but I, I think it's what, it's what was done by the church at the time, and he was involved with uh, bishops at the time, and was involved somewhat in church. Uh, in, in the fight in Mainz, he backed the wrong side. He backed the losing side and was exiled from Mainz for a time until he was honored again. So he was involved in the local church politics, as was everyone, of course. Trey, do you mind if I jump in there for one second? Please do, Alex. Thanks. Uh, the, the whole debate there about, you know, the technology being agnostic and um, also the, the, the points you were making about, oh, did it matter if the nail was machined and little detail work like that, that to me is sort of like that whole McLuhanite, um, you know, view of the thing to say, well, it's more the overall gesture and the totality and how much a, a new medium uh, or new mediums, using the false plural there purposefully, uh, how much that really changes, you know, how we do things. And I think Jeff was at South by Southwest Eye there the other day, as was I, and, and I sort of, you know, just from watching how everybody walked around there using all their smartphones and tablets, that to me was really almost the biggest meaning of the thing, you know, l let alone... Does it, it doesn't matter if somebody's using Android or, or iOS or any other thing like that, but it's really about, wow, you know, everybody is doing this, and the take-up of this particular technology has happened within, as far as the smartphone is concerned, about five years. As far as the tablets are concerned, you know, two, two years, basically. So <laughs> that's extraordinary in terms of, you know, medium is the message uh, kind of stuff right there. I think you're absolutely right, Alex. One of the things that I face teaching journalism and working with newspapers and stuff and magazines and books and such is that media, we in media tend to look at the world godlike in our own image. We think everything is a medium. And part of the assumption is that the Internet is a medium. And, and when I used to say that, Doc Searles, who's one of the co-authors of the great Clue Train Manifesto, uh, scolded me and said, no, 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 if you call it a medium, it brings all that baggage and perhaps regulation. Uh, with it. And, and I think he's right. The internet is something different and we don't have an analog for it. It's, uh, you know, I, I tend to call it the, a street corner on Times Square. It's life. And, and it's not packaged like media. And it's, it's a tool that we can use in ways we can't yet imagine. So I think you're right. When you walk around South by Southwest or a street corner on Times Square, watch people bumping into the street, you know, typing as they go, uh, they're just beginning to figure out new ways. You know, indeed, why do we call this a phone still? My kids never talk on it. I can't get my son to call me today, <laughs> right? Uh, right? It's something different. It's something new, and we don't know what it is. And the analog is always that we called a horse, uh, a, a car, a horseless carriage, and we, we uh, called printing automated writing. And uh, we don't know what this is yet. So I think you're right. The first best analog is media, but it's even a bigger change than that. I think that uh, you you pointed out that the obvious technological change in, in terms of information technology that the the movable type printing press brought us was uh, the the speed of, of execution of of, of, of uh, copying of being able to have uh, all these uh, uh, copies made at a much more inexpensive way that so that, as you said, the scholars no longer had to go to the books. The books could come to them. Um, but one of the secondary effects that I think you pointed out that, that was interesting is that uh, the correctness of duplication was really important too, right? I mean, before the scribes, they, they made errors, they made abbreviations, they alighted. Yeah, but Eisenstein points out that, of course, there were errors in printed works as well, and those errors could, could also spread quickly. Uh, there was a, a forbidden Bible that left the knot off one commandment, I'll let you guess which one it was. 
and uh, uh, the, the, the publishers were fined for this uh, for fairly obvious reasons, or, 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 or the law came down on them. So yes, errors could be spread too. What fascinates me in some of the stories that Eisenstein tells, some of the early efforts to do, for example, catalogs of botany were crowdsourced. The author said to people, send me, people would send in samples, whole samples and drawings of things, and they would send in corrections, and the authors would give credit for the corrections in subsequent editions. And the idea that a book was a frozen uh, sculpture wasn't yet in the mindset. It was more of wet clay, and people did change them, and they were changeable beasts. I think it was important. So on the one hand, yes, the fact that knowledge was printed at scale and speed and permanence meant that you could have something to check against. And that's part of what led, Eisenstein argues, to the scientific revolution, the ability to compare knowledge. And that right there led to a whole new way to, to, to look at the world. Uh, but we were never perfect. We still are. Mistakes happen. So, uh, Jeff, uh, oh, you, you've been uh, quiet so far. Here, do you, do you have, want to add, jump in? I would. Jeff, uh, at location 19, roughly, in the book, you mentioned that uh, man's observation is that printing was a technology waiting to happen. How much credit would you give to, let's say, the community scene, kind of in a Brian Eno, or Eno, uh, Kevin Kelly, senior kind of way, versus Gutenberg's own genius? It's, it's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, the records are gone so much that we don't really know exactly what was happening around. And as I mentioned in the book, too, there were two efforts to claim provenance that had both been pretty much shot down. And it's also very important to give full credit to uh, Asia, China, and Korea, uh, where you know, movable type was, in fact, invented much earlier. It just wasn't as economically efficient there. And there wasn't the reason to make it become an industry at scale. Um, you know, it's it's a horse and car a horse and cart question that's pretty much impossible to answer, I think. Uh, and and you know, part of the question is is was Gutenberg, just to carry the analogy again, perhaps stupidly, was you know was he Steve Jobs in the sense that he didn't invent everything, that he found something magnificent at uh, Xerox and uh, productized it, same as Bill Gates did. Bill Gates did not invent really MS DOS. He he borrowed on CPM, uh, and so. You know, we don't know, but I think you still have to give him credit the way we give Jobs credit for putting out this magnificent work of beauty and proving it, and, and for more than anything, bringing the hand mold to scale. When, when the one partner died and um, the brothers tried to come in, part of what came out in the court hearings at the time, which I didn't have in the Gutenberg piece, but there were efforts to, Gutenberg sent his, 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 his people off to destroy some of the things that were left in the workshop. And particular reference is made to taking out screws. And they know that that means the press, because the press is pretty obvious what it's built for. But the screws and the mold, they wanted to take that mold apart so you couldn't figure out how to put it back together. Because you saw in the picture, it's a very complex little beast. And, and I think we do have to give him credit for putting all this together. Uh, were there, were there, were, did he stand on the shoulders of others? Of course, and absolutely. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I think we, we we can well compare the Gutenberg Bible to the iPad, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, George, you uh, did did you want to jump in? It, I thought thought you said something earlier that you. Well, we were having a little offline discussion there on uh, some of the parallels to uh, the internet today where we expect the internet I guess to be uh, totally issue neutral as far as uh, the medium. Uh, it's there for the pros, the cons, whatever and going back and what we're hearing today about what was happening here in the early days with Gutenberg, anything that got on print was printed because somebody had a position that they wanted to uh, come out with and not only that it seemed like the printer themselves was very much involved on the pot on their side of what was being printed. I don't know if the printer would, even if he needed the money, necessarily uh, print something that was against his own uh, feelings, as it were. 
Right, some of this is history that I'm not very versed on. Uh, one of the, the problems we have with, with Gutenberg's work is there was no colophon, no, no page taking credit for what he printed. And that, that was invented basically a little bit later, along with the notion of the index. And for that matter, the table of contents at some point had to come along later. The idea that you had a structure to this work uh, that was possible. And, and I think that that's uh, new. You know, I asked myself a few years ago whether the internet had a political bent. Right? It's argued that um, uh, television is essentially le means left, whether that's just because who's on it or because it's something true to the media. I don't know. There's an argument that talk radio leans right uh, because it's it's right for I don't know complaining. Uh, sorry, it's just a joke. Um, uh, where does cable go? And, and I wondered whether the internet at one point kind of leaned uh, a third direction, libertarian, because uh, it's it's it, it resists rules. Uh, and, I, and I thought that for a while, and then I thought that that no, it's more of a blank slate that people can use however they want to use, and people are learning how to use in various ways. And I don't think the medium comes with that. Uh, and, and now the, the publisher so much uh, doesn't matter, whereas the publisher in the past, you're absolutely right, did. And indeed, Eisenstein has this great picture of a print shop that was filled not just with you know, inkers and pressmen and uh, paper handlers, but also with typesetters, obviously, but also with authors and translators and correctors. And that it was a kind of mini university of the time, which is kind of a lovely view of this this smelly factory of knowledge. Well, if you'll forgive me, uh, Stephen Colbert said that uh, reality has a well-known liberal bias. bias <laughs> and, uh, so uh, if the internet reflects reality, we, we're in trouble. Um, so I want to... Uh, I want to call on uh, Shaba because you've been making some real... So we, we have a little uh, side uh, chat going. If you've used a Google Plus Hangout, you know that there's a, there's a chat, and, and we're using that to kind of coordinate who's going to talk next and so on. But Shaba, you've had some really interesting comments on that, on that chat. Oh, well, one of the things that I wanted to point out was that, uh, you know, the, the old saying in journalism is that, uh, you know, freedom of the press is limited by those who pay for, what is the, the, the thing, those that... Uh, buy their uh, ink and barrels, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, and this is even more true uh, back in Gutenberg's day because we're talking about a time when there is not a cash economy. So the people who are actually paying for Gutenberg and his rivals to print these things are a very, very small class of elites. And not only that, but a very small class, they're, they're feeding these things to a very, very small class of literate people. The only people who have access to higher education at this point in Europe uh, are people who take holy orders. Uh, the equivalent of higher education is limited to uh, male people taking higher taking holy orders from the Catholic Church uh, right up until the middle 1550s when the Florentine Academy is established in uh, by the de Medicis and Marsilio Ficino in Florence and that kind of starts busting open the idea of advanced education still only for young men. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book starts to wedge open obscurantism at that point. Uh, the idea that people should have free access to information, uh, which is still a battle that's going on today. Uh, which freedom of the press is part of, but that battle probably starts with Gutenberg, goes to the Florentine Academy, goes to uh, Amsterdam, and um, who's the philosopher I'm trying to think of? Uh, the... I can't remember my own uh, neighbor's name, so I'm not going to do anything. Oh my gosh! You uh, started out Jewish, ended up uh, oh, um, in Amsterdam. In in oh, I can't. Uh, no, 
I hate it when I lose a name. Oh, well, senior moment. Um, but at any rate, you know, it goes right down to the to, to the modern day when we're sitting there and saying, you know, we've got a whole mess of people who sit there and go, information wants to be free, and a whole mess of people sit there sitting there going, you can't handle the truth. And this is probably <laughs> the major tension between conservatives and liberals. And as a matter of fact, it's the origin of the term liberal, right? The term liberal actually comes not from, uh, we, we, we tend to forget that it comes from the idea of uh, liberation in terms of how people think. Um, and, and most of that really starts with the dissemination of ideas outside of the church, which the kernel comes with the dissemination of information more freely with the invention of the book. I wish you were doing the whole session. Let's have another session just with you, with you talking through this history of the internet and, and, and perspectives. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, I think mean, one of the things that fascinated me in, in, in another book I referenced is that before, um, uh, you know, there, there's this group that did a lot of wonderful work called the Making Publics Project. Uh, a professor out of McGill started it. And, and, and part of what he talks about is that when a market was created for the creation of culture, of works, that that changed the essence of it. So that when, um, art, when, when, when painters were no longer just commissioned by churches or by patrons, and they had to make a market out in the world with it, then that changed obviously the nature of what they did. And, and the point was made that a book had a very clear business model. It had one patron. Right? One person paid one scribe for one copy, and that's how it worked. And, and then when, when the economics changed overnight with the printing press, uh, the capital requirements as well, by the way, so you're right, they had to have some access to capital. It was still limited, but it started to blow it up more and more. And, and you know, Martin Luther's treatises were, were just little pamphlets uh, that, that were thus cheaper to make and smaller and, and had more impact. You know, length was not always always a virtue. Um, Seth Godin uh, had, had a post uh, a couple of days ago about, about how short is, is smart, too. Uh, but then the other thing that fascinates me, you're right, Sean, about this, is, is that it's, the, we tend to talk so much about the impact on media, but the impact on education then and now is gigantic. The idea that we changed, uh, John Naughton makes this point, that we changed the, the notion of childhood when we changed the notion of education. The idea that uh, you didn't just sit at the feet of the lecturer, but you could now take over some of your educational abilities yourself. You could teach yourself things. That was revolutionary. That was frightening to people. And today, with education, I don't think we've gone nearly, nearly far enough. And I operate in a university, and a university deserves disruption every bit as much as a newspaper does or a retail chain does, I think, uh, because there are new opportunities and new ways to do things. Would you disagree, Shabba? Um, actually, one of the wonderful things that you find, of, you know, what, 150 years ago is the establishment of the public library movement, which was established and then, you know, kicked in the pants and, and, and really accelerated by Carnegie, Carnegie, sorry, who saw it as an alternative for uh, the disadvantaged population to get their own education because education for the poor in this country was so bad, and it still is, that the motivated among the disadvantaged needed an alternative to public education. And by the way, that philosopher Spinoza <laughs> that I was trying to think of, I had to Google it in, oh, on the side. So there you go. One of the things that, that, that I struggle with these days, going beyond net neutrality, at the end of my, my book, Public Parts, I, I talk about principles of an open society. And I, and I start with the idea that, that uh, to connect is a right, is a human right. Not in the sense that government should necessarily pay for every connection, though Finland is going that way, making it a constitutional right. But the idea that if Mubarak cuts off your connection, your human rights are, are clearly violated. I'd be interested to hear the views of the room about how to view the Internet. If we think that it's a, a utility, if it's like roads, then there are institutions to, to run the roads. At first it was you know, turnpike um, managers, and then it was the government. Uh, is the internet a utility, in which case it's government-run, perhaps, and regulated, which frightens me? Is it a right 
uh, that we should all have, uh, like like water. Um, given the power that it potentially has to change education, media, and, and life, how do you view? How do how do you tell people we should look at the internet? Well, so uh, I'm going to uh, go left to right in the order on my screen. I know it's different on yours and on YouTube, but uh, uh, Alex, give give us your your response to. Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, granted, you know, on the one hand, most of the pipes that make up the internet uh, are still owned by, uh, you know, corp, you know, large, very large corporations, and they're all most all for profit. So that's, you know, but then at the same time, yes, there, the whole internet did start, you know, DARPAnet and everything as a as a government uh, uh, run thing too. So so that's kind of a that's really an interesting one. Because it seems like it, it, you know, if anything, it almost like wants to transcend each one of those. And so, yes, it, it kind of does go beyond even a utility. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I mean, there are clearly people that are trying to, you know, chime in there and 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 throttle it at different places. And you know, that's, I, I think that's a large battle that's going to go on for quite some time. Uh, George. Uh, the uh, whole situation that uh, started going off on there with the libraries, which is the uh, storehouse of all this in the past, uh, now in the future, how is the library going to come into a new invention of itself, not only to deal with the new media that's out there, but the, the new demands of the consumer? The consumer anymore is not necessarily wanting to have those wonderful bookshelves like I see behind Jeff uh, when they could put probably the entire library here in my town onto my uh, phone or onto my Kindle or ebook reader or whatever type. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, we're only, just like Gutenberg was the start, we're at the beginning of where all this is going to go. And I think, you know, the reinvention, as it were, of the... Uh, whole library and publishing system is just something that, you know, the consumers are going to ask for it and demand that it happen. And I, and, you know, my own experience with it is that I see reluctance from the library side, from the publisher side, to want to let us have the access. You know, I, I wrote this in one of my things that, you know, I want, I, I got very excited when I could borrow books from my library onto my phone or my Kindle or whatever, and then I found a book that I wanted to read after the tedious process of going through their web pages, and then I got in line with between 50 and 60 people, and about three months later, I got an email that said, your book is now ready, and I had 10 days to read it before it disappeared. It, there's got to be something better. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for that. letting me do that comment. I. Uh, uh, Jeff O. Oops, you're, you're muted. I'm pretty much in agreement with George on the library issue. Oh. Okay, I'm pretty much in agreement with George on the uh, library issue uh, for what that's worth. We had a fracas like that here in Rockford, Illinois, and I came back saying that uh, essentially I view the library as a library holding books is irrelevant, and everybody went nuts. <laughs> that aside, the Internet issue, when, I, when you look at that, I'm a kind of free market libertarian guy, and even I think the Internet approach is something that may rise to a fundamental right. It's close, because going back to Jeff's point about is it a medium or not a medium, I view it almost as fundamental, like Jeff's saying, like the, you know, the public, I would say like the public square or the equivalent of air. It's the transmission mode for speech. It's also a place of, as Jeff points out, assembly and gathering. So uh, I'm... Uh, that's about as close as you get to a right in terms of things you have to pay for, I think. Thanks. Uh, Radisla? Well, yes. I would like to point out that uh, Gutenberg Express or the books are quite similar, actually, to the Internet uh, in the matter that they are uh, the media that promotes speech, that promotes free speech, that's uh, free to use. Well, some of the time. Um, I remember I went on the internet about in 1992. It was still a time when uh, the sites wouldn't have passwords. 
that's pretty amazing uh, compared to today. Uh, just the same way uh, the printing press, the books and everything about books evolved, so is evolving the internet. It's changing, it's changing this very moment, uh, but it's still, uh, it's still uh, shaped the way it was shaped uh, from the beginning as something that would uh, offer you a means of communications. Of course, uh, we can add to that, we can sell something, we can uh, make a business case out of the internet, but in its core, it's still the media for uh, transmi transmitting the, the information for communication between one or more persons. I think that's going to stay. I think we, don't, we, we can't stop that. And uh, Shara? Well, there are several aspects of the way that the, am I on? Yes, you are. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, there are several aspects of this. First off, I, I wanted to respond to a couple things. People are, are railing against the libraries. The libraries are really captors, captive to publishing. The things that people are complaining about, about the cues for these copies of books, those books are being restricted in how many licenses they can hand out by the publishers. They're being restricted as to what titles can be handed out by the publishers. That's not something that the librarians can do anything about. The librarians were on board with electronic services well before the publishers, well before any institutions in society. They were indexing, they were doing everything with the internet before anybody. They were wonderful. They were in Second Life. They were online. They were doing everything well before the newspapers, well before the magazines, well before anybody. So give the librarians some credit. You know, they were here first. They really, really, really were. They were here before the dot coms. They were here before anybody. But that aside, I think the role of you know, how we should be treating the internet is we should be treating the internet as a public resource in the same way, kind of the way Jeff was saying, you've got uh, going all the way back to English common law, which, you know, at least in the United States, okay, English common law is where we base our law off of. If you go all the way back to the law of Elizabeth, which is where we base our nonprofit law, our nonprofit law originally comes from this clause that sits there and says bridges and toll roads and all these sort of things where there are private interests that alleviate the role of government should be made tax exempt, and, but they also have to be regulated so that it is made clear that they are acting in the public interest. So that's the basis, that's the principal basis of how we define what utilities and nonprofits and all of these 501 blah sort of things that the IRS regulates how all of those things are set up. Anybody who touches the internet, even if they're a commercial ISP, should be under regulation to make sure, just like they were under the FCC, duh, that they are serving like a broadcaster, like any kind of media company that is serving the public interest, that they are out there serving the public interest. They're a telecom company. They should be doing the same sort of thing that a phone company is doing. Phone companies since the 1920s have had to provide minimal service to anybody who needs it, no matter what the cost was to get out to the furthest person in the furthest 
rural, no matter what it costs to get there, there's this, uh, there's a clause in U.S. law that says if somebody lives out in the middle of nowhere and it costs more than it costs to, for that person to pay for it, to run a phone line out there, you still have to get them a phone line. This is part of U.S. law. Mm. But I, I, nobody does anything to up that for Internet service, and there's no discussion of doing it because mm. somehow Internet service is not considered to be the same thing as phone service. It is not considered to be the modern equivalent of basic telecommunications service. And it's more, and therefore, it is more critical. And all of this sort of access should be more critical, not more luxurious. I agree with you on all that. I also raise some caution um, that uh, I, I worry about some levels of government involvement uh, in this because we can have a you know, benign, um, beneficent uh, uh, regulator and dictator involved in doing exactly what you said, which is to make sure that it protects the public interest. But at the same time, we had governments, uh, good and bad, trying to come in and under the guises of piracy, privacy, security, decency, even civility, um, argue that um, they need to tame the Internet. They need to control right. the Internet. And There's I a, agree with all of that, too. Well, There's a piece I, I think in, that would be obvious. Right, right. But I think that that's the fear. So if we say uh, it's, it's the conundrum of net neutrality law that I've mm -hmm. tried to figure out, uh, even though I'm disagreeing with lots of other things, but Al Franken said we're not trying to change the Internet. We're trying to keep the Internet from changing. And the, the notion that all bits are created equal. But there's a piece in the Vanity Fair. I, I, don't, I don't normally buy it, but uh, it's... Um, I will buy this one, uh, called World War 3.0, the May issue coming up, uh, arguing that the fight that's coming up over nations like uh, Iran and China uh, that want to have more control over the Internet and use the UN as an agent to do that. Uh, there's going to be some big, huge fights coming up over, over, over the freedom that we have. I think the Internet is potentially disruptive to all those institutions and more. And that's mm -hmm. why they're suddenly fearing them. You know, why are we have suddenly have all this effort to regulate the Internet? It's not broken. It's working just fine. Right. But there are many governments coming in and trying to regulate it, and I fear for that. Well, and there's a third aspect to it also, which is that there are a few very large corporations, and pardon me, Trey, you know, but Google is one of them. Facebook is one of them. There are a few others. You know, Microsoft is one of them that have undue control over different aspects of how people use and have access to and create contact, uh, content on and can exchange content on the Internet. Wouldn't you say the telephone companies are probably the most in that case, like telcos? No, yeah, I wouldn't. No? No, no, no. Actually, I would say they have maybe how you connect. But, for example, yes. if we are here, for example, um, my, you know, if, if I want to, well, let me not use Google because that would be rude. Uh, so I oh, will go ahead, use Google. It's fine. Uh, well, it seems like it, it, it's, it's biting the hand that's hugging. Oh, no. I've, I've, I've had I a I also wrote a Google there. fanboy book, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't yeah, need uh, a bunch of Google deference uh, on Google. Uh, well, okay. So um, I happen to be one of the people who was uh, being the loyal opposition when we were getting into Google Plus at first and talking about the NIM Wars. And for Thank those you. in the audience who might not know about what the NIM Wars were, uh, everything in Google Plus is tied to your Google profile. And a lot of people are not comfortable necessarily having everything that they write tied down to what their real name is. And so uh, there are, and you can go and you can, you know, I invite people to look up NYM Wars and you'll find all sorts of stuff written about this. But 
if it were that Google Plus were to become the dominant way by which everybody had a social network connection and you know your business and your social connections and all of your different things were coming through Google Plus on a pragmatic basis through a corporation which was not subject to regulation or oversight by any means whatsoever um, by a corporation which was not regulated by any kind of privacy law, by privacy regulation, by anything except for a privacy policy which they have a right to change without notice on you at any time, retroactively. Then, you know, what, why is this any better than anything that happens with governments? You know, you've got a bunch of issues having to do with the corporate domination of how we access the internet, how we use the internet, how uh, the agglomerate, the social agglomeration of how we access the internet is run these days. Jeff, you have a response? Actually, I met you, Jeff. I'd be curious to hear your response. I have a response, oh. which would be then don't you then don't use Google, but yeah. that would be my response. The, you know, I, I I did write a fanboy book about Google, using them as an example of of of, of how to look at the world differently. Paul, what would Google do? And so I can be accused of that, and I'm and I'm guilty to a great extent. Uh, but I, even I don't want Google to be in a position to. Um, I do admire Google. I, I don't think that they should be put in a position, and they say they shouldn't be put in a position, of protecting the net. They had to do that, for example, in the case of China, where I think they made the wrong move and they made the right move. And one can debate the motives and so on, but Google's still a company. And uh, that's why, that's really, to a great measure, why I wrote Public Parts, is because I think what we have to have is exactly the discussion we're having now. And so probably I think oh, this would go on for hours, so we'll probably have to cut this off soon. But, but we need a discussion about the principles of an open society and of the tools that enable it. And that's really what I think is vital. And, and we're not having that discussion as much as we're getting down into nitty gritties of certain regulations and um, certain governments that want to control the net and the freedom that it enables. And uh, uh, yes, we should have debates about, about how to um, react to companies that take on power, especially as platforms become more and more powerful in our new world, in our new ecosystem. Uh, but I also worry that, that when Iran and China want to, you know, we saw that China cut off comments on Sina Weibo uh, yesterday because of rumors about there about uh, uh, insurrections. Uh, we see um, uh, Sarkozy promising to tame and, and civilize the net, and that frightens me greatly. Uh, especially because I didn't really much like The Artist as a movie. Um, <laughs> joke. Uh, and so uh, these, this is the discussion that we should have and probably have another time. Uh, uh, and, and I don't pretend to say that it's settled at all. These are the, the, this is how we're trying to reinvent our institutions for now. Well, uh, I got a question, Dave. Um, I, have, I got a question. Sure. Well, can I can I first start, uh, Aaron, by introducing you? Because sure. uh, you, you uh, got on... Yeah. You got on late, but uh, you're a professor of computer science in uh, no, no, no. Christ Church, uh, New Zealand? I teach, I teach uh, epidemiology health sciences. Oh, very I different. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Com computer science, epidemiology, yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, well, you know. Um, the, the question that I have for Jay would be, uh, what would Gutenberg do in a time like this? How, how you think, uh, uh, you know, what, what would be Gutenberg's position had he lived in the times such as ours, because that was a uh, you know as I was reading your book, it, it seemed that you wanted to connect two different times, and two completely different paradigms of thought. And uh, you know how would you uh, you take it? So that's that's one of the questions. I'll I I'll, I'll first claim the prerogative of a professor and a New Yorker and answer a question with a question. Uh, do you have a view on that? No, uh, no, but uh, that's only because I haven't read your book or your essay deeply enough to uh, take a position. 
But that, that was a question that I had yeah. in my mind when I was reading this. I, I, I don't think we can know because we simply don't know enough about Gutenberg. Uh, you know, there's, no, there's no record of his, from him, no direct, very little direct record of him except the court cases about him. Um, and, and, and I could be accused, it's right, of stretching my, my parallels and using it for my own purposes, uh, which I'm perfectly guilty of and, 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 and did for those purposes, where I want to talk about Gutenberg's lessons as an entrepreneur and the impact of his disruption, which I think is great. And it was said earlier that, that, that he knew he was on to something because he kept it secret, but certainly he could never have known the, 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 the impact that he would have and his invention would have on the world, which is to say that we don't know now either. We don't know the impact of the Internet. It's, it's, I, one could argue it's less than I'm arguing. That's fine, because I don't know either. Uh, I think it's potentially greater. So I, that's what made me get some, the notion of Gutenberg as an innovator and entrepreneur put him for me in a more human frame, in a more finite frame where I could try to understand him better. He had a goal, which was to print these, these books. He had a vision for that that was magnificent in their execution in the end. Uh, and he had to overcome all kinds of obstacles to get there. And like an entrepreneur, he did that. You know, he found capital. He found cash flow. He solved technology problems. He invented what he needed to invent. Uh, he just didn't have a good lawyer. Uh, it, it, you know, at the end, and that's how he lost the business. Yeah. So I, I, think, I think it makes him uh, far more mortal to think of uh, Gutenberg. Uh, I, I would say this, finally. I think that uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page and Sergey Brin uh, and um, I'd probably throw Ev Williams into that from, from Blogger and Twitter probably have a clearer sense of their impact than Gutenberg could possibly have had. Yeah. And that's, and that's possibly because we are standing on the shoulders of people like Gutenberg and, and Columbus and Vasco da Gama because the time of Gutenberg was also the time when Europe um, went out you know, expanding uh, her um, savings into the other parts of the world. So he was possibly a product of his own time. I, I think so very much. And, and, and in this work by the Making Publics group uh, out of McGill, and I recommend looking up what they did, there's a 13-part Canadian Broadcasting Corporation series about their work uh, and the ideas program. It's quite wonderful. And they argued that, uh, of course, we, we, we know the compass and gunpowder uh, and uh, changed the way the world operated. And they argue that the, the mere discovery, of course, of the new world, where I am, um, threw open people's notions, their cognition of their world. It wasn't in the neat map they thought it was. It was something different. And once you tear that rug up from underneath you, how many more rugs go? Yes. What more do you question? And I think that's really, it was a time of great disruption. And to me, that's the other lesson, is that is the times of disruption are like uh, you know, seed beds to entrepreneurs. Uh, <laughs> it opens the door for them to create things and change things and to see that possibility. All right. Yeah. Well, so uh, we're getting near 90 minutes now. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I'd like to ask one last question of you, Jeff, and that's uh, what did you think of the experiment? Uh, well, I, 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 w I wait to see what, what the room thought. I'm the one who had the privilege of blathering on at, at great length. Uh, and, and, uh, but I, I um, you know, this is, pardon me, I'm going to have my internet triumphalist moment. This is what's great about this, right? I've not met any of you. Trey and I have met before through, through things, but I've not met any of you, uh, you know, starting with, with Shava's wonderful comments and, and, and erudition all the way through you, Aaron, at the end. Uh, I learned a great deal in merely 90 minutes. Uh, I would have learned more if I'd shut up more. Uh, always the case. And uh, these connections get made in a way that was not possible from from New York to to Christchurch. And that's that's uh, God damn it. That's a wonderful thing. And so Trey, I'm I'm really glad you did this. I'll be eager to hear your thoughts afterwards as to how you're going to do your next one. Uh, you know, one thing we learned is not to have required reading, uh, uh, but I think to have content and discussion like this to bring people together to use these tools to do that. Uh, thank you for doing it. Well, thank you for uh, being our first guest of honor. I think the, uh, 
I, I would certainly love to do this again, and uh, and uh, I'm, I look forward to people uh, joining the T3W page, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll set up a, a post later on today, and, and you can uh, suggest some possible topics uh, and possible guests, maybe. Um, I I want to thank all of you for uh, joining in on the conversation and for joining on the hangout. Um, uh, Jeff wanted to know what the rest of you thought of the experiment. Uh, quick thumbs up, yes. thumbs down. Be honest. No. no. Google. Ha I mean, Hangouts is is, is like oh, the app of, of of Google Plus, if, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I I do want to just thank you all uh, very much, uh, and uh, I should. Uh, make the mandatory disclosure that uh, although I am an employee of Google, that uh, T3W is not a, a project of or, or approved by uh, Google Incorporated. Um, and all of your thoughts, all of your thoughts are yours and yours alone. Um, and uh, this, uh, for those of you watching live, uh, this will be on uh, in its entirety in YouTube in a few hours. So it, we have to do processing, whatever that means. And uh, I will post it at that point and uh, keep a lookout for that. And thank you all. Um, folks uh, on the, the, the Hangout here, uh, if you want to uh, uh, join a little cool down postmortem that I was going to do, I, I'll, I'll join, I'll introduce you or invite you to that in just a, a few minutes. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you, Trey. Thanks, Trey. Thank, thank you, Trey. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Great.